you hear stuff in a way wherever you're mixing, whatever you're mixing on, that will translate to other playback systems. It doesn't matter what your playback system is. It matters, does it sound right on other people's playback systems? Because if you said, well, you can't mix unless you're in perfect speakers in a perfect room, does that mean people can't listen to it unless they have perfect speakers in a perfect room? Because if that's the case, your mix probably sucks because it doesn't work anywhere that anybody actually listens to stuff. And that's Part of why I have no problem mixing in headphones, if it didn't translate, then I wouldn't do it. But it does because I've learned to do it. Um, But also, going back to the Atmos, obviously, I would love everybody to have lots and lots of speakers wherever they listen to these Atmos mixes. But the reality is 99% (laughs) of it probably is on headphones that people are listening. And so they're getting a binaural representation and there are two different versions of it. There's the Dolby version and the Apple version, and we're not going to go into any of that. But the idea is to take what is supposed to be coming out of lots of speakers and figure out how to make it sound like you're in a room with lots of speakers when you listen on headphones. And since that's the case, you would be remiss if you didn't do some work on your Atmos mixes and headphones. You have to, to make sure that what you're hearing in the room is actually translating through these binaural processes and sounds like you want it to sound. So yeah, it's a big, big part of it. Well, that's um, hopefully a bit of encouragement for any, um, well, if anyone's watching who's a just starting out bedroom producer and was about to think as I once did, well, you need, you know, yeah, big tannoys in a big, perfect room. No, I mean, and and for Atmos, like you just try it on headphones. I mean, you want to get into a room and hear it on speakers at some point if you can, but there's no reason. I mean, it's all built into Logic now. It integrates really well with Adobe Renderer and Pro Tools. I think Nuendo has it completely built in. Mess around with it. You know, try it. It's there. It's not, yeah. It's not off limits. No. And in the way that it would have been in like 1972, being able to learn any of this stuff. Yeah. And I think though, in a way, it's weird to me because it is, like, it's very technical. There are things you have to understand and know. You can't just luck yourself into an Atmos mix. You got to understand what you're doing. You have to deal with certain volume limitations and like there's stuff you need to know to make it work. And other stuff you need to know to actually make it work well. And all of a sudden, we're back to the point where like, wow, mix engineers actually need to like know stuff. So now it isn't just everybody on the planet with a laptop and a pair of headphones does exactly the same thing I do and sometimes better. I actually feel like I've got a little bit of an edge because I'm such a technical geek and I sold an Eve console so I could afford some speakers and, you know. So yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't have the same barrier to entry like we we're talking about forever ago about getting into a studio to make a record. But I think to be successful and do commercial Atmos mixes, most people are going to need to actually invest in equipment and time. But I'm sure there are going to be some savants who do it on headphones and it is fucking awesome and better than anything I can do. And that's it because that's always the case. Can you um, name, as a sort of closing statement, maybe, uh, any of those kind of savants that you were just mentioning where you think, how have they done this? All they've got is a you know, really crap laptop and they've done this amazing thing. Well, I don't know about crap laptop, but hmm. I would say like Juana Molina, her records are amazing. And as far as I know, there's one that someone else mixed, but she does everything herself in Digital Performer. I don't know what her studio setup is other than that. I just watched a couple interviews because I got obsessed because they're so good. Um, but, uh, the first Latin Playboys record, which I think for a lot of engineers is like a real benchmark of the Chad Blake distorted things, whatever. He doesn't take enough credit for the way that record sounds. Cause it obviously sounds the way it does because of him, but huge chunks of that record were done on a horribly broken cassette four track in Louis kitchen. Like that's where that record started and they didn't replace stuff. They just added to it. And like one of the ways Chad dealt with how noisy a lot of the recordings were would be to actually add noise. Just like, well, I can't fix what's there. So I'm going to add so much noise that the noise that's coming and going on that thing won't bother you and (coughs) that kind of thing. So I think like, you know, it's one of the coolest sounding records ever made. And it was finished in a studio with an API and whatever, but it absolutely is a four track cassette record. That's really something that keeps coming back now 
uh, com- coming back to me now, which is that um, you can obsess over some things that, you know, mentioning an API made me think that we, you know, we used to think this sounds good. How did they conceive of something sounding that good? How did they make it sound that perfect? And um, often I think, and I hope this is true in your experience, what happens is, you know, people ex- make stuff in a creative and exploratory way and then it propagates and then, you know, it becomes popular and then you think all of that was a conscious decision. And a lot of it, you know, might not be if you say like, how did, I don't know, how did the, you know, electric piano sound so good on Let It Be for the sake of argument. And it's like, well, they weren't thinking that hard about that. They were thinking about the music and now you're just used to it and you have that experience of it. Yeah. Well, look, the, what makes the sounds on a record great are the way they work together. And what's great about the electric piano sounds on those records is how everything else works with it. It just works perfectly with it. It's about the balance and it's about the way the sounds go together. And that is Glyn John's brilliance for his entire career. Al Schmidt's brilliance for his entire career. It's about the balance and the way the sounds work together, not that is the best kick drum sound ever, like empirically. And if I solo it, it will be the best kick drum sound ever. It's like, man, those drums are just on fire. And in some cases, it will be the sound, like when the levee breaks, it's about the drum sound. But it's really easy to get a drum sound like that. And then none of the other instruments actually work with it because the drums are so huge and it just sounds terrible and everything falls apart. Their genius is arranging that song and getting guitar tones that work with those drums. So that's a great point to jump off on uh, for Andrew Sheps. It's, it's, you know, it's not about, it, it's like cooking, isn't it? It's about what goes together as opposed to each individual thing. And, yes, and, and absolutely. That's... And if you find yourself obsessing about an individual thing, you've lost the plot. You need to like stop doing that and just zoom out a little bit and see what's going on. We're going to get that put on the wall in these studios. 